Good morning, everybody. My name is Rhiannon from Barbecue Spit Rotisseries. I'm the general manager here and one of the founders. And today we are extremely lucky um, to be joined by Boomer from Boomer's Thank Barbecue, you. who is a bit of a legend in the industry. I'm sure many of you um, have heard of him or are following him on social. Or some of them may have even seen him at Meatstock or been to one of his classes. So he has kindly volunteered his time today um, to come and share his knowledge with us. He's going to be breaking down a pig. Um, as you can see over there, the smoke is already lit. Um, he was here at 5 a.m. this morning getting the, the first pig on. So we're hoping that that pig will be ready about 12 for you all to be able to have a bit of a sample. Um, but what we're going to do is wind the clock back and he's going to start I'm preparing this one for you. So um, just a tiny bit of housekeeping for those of you that are physically here today. Um, bathrooms are inside the showroom to the left. Just look for the white door. Um, we are currently running a 20% off sale on barbecue. So feel free um, to have a look. And we've collaborated with Boomer as well that if you are to get an offset smoker, we will throw in and pay for your ticket to one of his classes. So I'm sure he'll talk a bit about what he does and all the, the things that he does during his cooking class. So um, by all means, ask as many questions as you like about that as well. Um, and if you're interested in attending one of his classes, um, hit up the boys in the showroom um, and we'll sort you out there and get you a ticket for the next one. But um, without further ado, I'll pass over to Boomer. I know he's a wealth of knowledge and please ask questions. We want as many questions either in person or um, for those of you watching from home, please ask away, just type it in the, the chat and um, we'll get Boomer to ask um, to answer those for you. So over to you, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, thanks guys. Um, we've been trying to get some of these like cool little demos and events done down here. So it's good to finally be able to get a date that works for us all and um, sort of showcase some of well, hopefully my skill today, but you know, I love doing these sort of whole pigs. It's um, ever since getting this trailer, it was a bit of a new way of cooking, sort of a long story. I'll, I'll rattle on about heaps of stuff because I just go off on tangents, but that pit was originally designed as a whole hog trailer. I've sort of modified a few things on it so I can cook a hell of a lot more. It used to only have one rack of food, you know, one rack of cooking in it and it was just for pigs. That's all the two people who owned it prior to me used to cook. Um, I've since added a couple of other racks in it. So, you know, we can fit about 24 briskets in it at a time now, which we've done for a couple of catering gigs, but it was designed for pigs. It cooks pigs really well. Um, these are obviously more what they just, you know, they call a little suckling or a squealer. They're only about 20, 25 kilos. So I like to cook a bit hotter. So they sort of take anywhere from five, six, seven hours. The bigger ones which we've done, we did a charity day last year for uh, Movember called Hogvember. I think some of you guys came along to that. So that was a 65 kilo pig. That took about 12 hours. So that sort of thing can cook it all. It's just time wise, different heats, you know. So if you haven't heard of me anyway, that was just a little bit about the trailer and pig, what we're gonna do today. We're gonna break this down, go through the process of how we would butterfly it and also explain there's sort of two options you could cook. You can cook it in a running style, which I'll go to in a minute, or um, butterflying it. So we'll talk about that, how we're going to break it down, how we're going to clean it up, inject it, season it. Then we'll get that one on. And hopefully by the time we've sort of done all this sort of part, the other one will be pretty close to coming off. If not, I'll move the other one to the top rack. We'll put this raw one down the bottom, keep going for a little bit. So we're sort of aiming some, sometime between 11 or 12. The other one will be ready to eat. So it will be samples for everyone. And this one, I'm just gonna keep cooking until this afternoon for, I don't know, maybe the family and the kids will come down later and we'll have a feed. I just thought, there's no point just putting it on ice for the rest of the day. We might as well do something with it. So, yeah, if you haven't heard of me, obviously, like Rhiannon said, I used to do comp barbecue for years. Um, sort of gave that up a little while ago, sort of pre-COVID, got back into just, you know, cooking for more at home and doing that. Working back on some rubs. I used to make rubs back in the day at home, which, over the last few years, we've released all four again properly and distributed them, we're, you know, all across Australia now. So we've got the beef rub, my pork rub, chicken rub, and my lamb rub. So sheared and seared for lamb, clucked and plucked for chicken, swine and dine for pork, and grazed and blazed for beef. We'll obviously be using the pork swine and dine today. We're going to also spin a heap of chicken wings later on the um, little cypress grill, just for another sort of sample. We'll put them on after this is all done. But yeah, so we did the rubs, then just around the corner in Caram Downs, we host the masterclasses. So if you hadn't seen that, I might as well just explain that, but it's a seven hour day. 
across six different smokers. So it's ranging from an offset, pallet, Weber, bullet, drum, and a ceramic. And we cook 11 different dishes and it's all live. So it's done like what you'd see here. None of that's prepped. You would come into the class, all the meat sitting in front of me. I get people involved, we trim, we season, we put them on across the six different smokers. We cook all day, you have a couple of drinks, we have something to eat. You know, hopefully learn a thing or two. We all have a good time and we host them once a month. So they're my, they're my master classes. And now that I've got the trailer, we do catering as well. So we sort of started catering late last year. We've probably done probably up nearly 20, 30 gigs so far over the last two or three months. Or, you know, December, November, December, January. Um, and that's been a heap of fun. And, you know, like I always sort of say, you're always learning as well. Like barbecue is one of those sort of arts that you're constantly learning, I think. No matter how good you are or where you are in barbecue, you learn with every single cook you do. You know, everyone's always chasing that perfect brisket or, you know, even with the hogs I'm trying to do, sometimes you absolutely nail one, then the next one, something's not as good. Then the next one, you pick up little things. So you're always learning and, you know, I think it's just a great way to cook. So other than, uh, we'll probably get into a little bit of this and then we can start asking some questions. We've already got the mail on. So I, unbeknownst to me, when I picked them up, I just spoke to the butcher. I generally get my pigs just from a local, or not local, but a Springvale butcher. You know, they go through a hell of a lot more pigs than most of the other butchers do. So Luke from Cali's got me onto them and he, I just ring them direct now and just tell them when and how many pigs I need. So we got two. This is a female, which is a 26 kilo pig. The male's in there, which is a 27 kilo pig. Um, with cooking them, as I said, you can sort of do them in running style. So running style is basically as they lay. It's going to be a bit awkward because it's all so soft, but you can sort of prop them up pretty much like that. You fold the legs. This has already been on ice for ages, so the legs are sort of a bit stiff, but you would fold it up pretty much like that. You know, the other legs tuck in when they're a bit more pliable, they would tuck in. You can fold these ones up. Sometimes you can prop the belly. You can actually prop the belly up the cavity a bit. And they call that running style as if, you know, as it, you know, as it would run really. Um, that's one technique. Now, obviously cooking a pig, a whole pig is a bit different unless you, you know, you can do it on a spit. You can do it splayed out like on the asado style. You can obviously use a smoker. This style, I've got a heap of room. So mine's a little bit different because I've got an absolute heap of room. So I can butterfly them out really easily. If you had an offset, we've seen the boys quite a few times, some of the local fellas run them like this in the offset and you just leave that like it for the whole cook. Try not to be obviously touching it too much because once this all starts to render down and break down, the skin will go firm. It's not gonna turn into what we know is that sort of Australian crackle, you know, real crunchy, crispy. It will generally go to a snapping texture like candy sort of but it doesn't puff up like our normal sort of crackle does. So if you're doing running style, yeah, you can sort of, sometimes you've got to watch with the guts because as it starts to break down, it sort of will change shape a little bit, but they can generally serve it like this. Um, other styles, butterfly, was that a question or are you sorry? Yep. Yeah, question, the difference in taste between male and females? Generally male and females, in theory, are nothing these days. It's just that, some of you may have come across, sometimes you'll get a bit of pork, whether it be a, a bit of belly, a bit of something from somewhere, like just wherever, it doesn't matter, butcher, supermarket, whatever. And some people have a, quite a strong taste or scent to it, and they call it boar taint. So you just can smell and taste a slight different flavor. Now that's usually obviously coming from the males. So with the males these days, they're generally chemically castrated at a very young age, so that you don't get that taint from being a male, I guess. But not everyone's noticed it. Like, there's been times where I've cooked male pork and no one has picked up on it, you know, like as in the family or friends or whoever, not one person picked up on it, but I've been able to, like, oh, I can just smell it. And it's, it's not totally offensive, it's just got this odor to it. So, they usually would say females are sweeter. So, you know, if you can actually pick what animal you get, which one you're getting, or, you know, it's a bit hard if you just go to a butcher and go, can I have a bit of pork belly? Because it could have come from whatever. But females are generally, you're not going to have the taint. So that's sort of, you know, but as I said, they've tried to castrate them chemically generally now. This one did have obviously everything, or that one did have everything removed. Um, it smelled really good, like both perfectly, no smell, freshness, but sometimes you can just notice something on the, once it's cooked. 
So, yeah. Um, oh, look, in terms of if you're doing ribs and that, like there's all turn th brands you really run. Now, obviously, you got your Berkshire and all the other, you know, I'm not great knowing all my different types of breeds, but there's really good brands, I guess. Like, you know, you can get like the Otway Pork um, is brilliant. Otway Pork's really good. Obviously, if you're looking at not just whole ones, but your Sun Pork, um, Borrowdale. Now, I'm not sure on all the breeds. I know there's so many different fancy breeds, but um, I'm trying to think what the boys over in WA are cooking. They're cooking a couple of pigs today as well. So I was trying to think what they got. They got some fancy free range, you know, chestnut fed pigs and all that sort of stuff. But um, that's probably another world I need to like look into a bit more. It's a bit different when you've got your Wagyu and Angus and grass grain, all that sort of stuff. But um, I usually just can't go wrong with the sort of main... The main sort of brands, as I said, this is the only reason I go with these from the butcher down in Springvale is this, uh, they go through, compared to most local butchers, they probably move 30 carcasses while other butchers will only move about five carcasses. They go through a lot more pork than most normal butchers do. So I just want to quickly just check those gauges. Yep. Before I get too carried away. So... We're going to butterfly this one. So we do need to clean up a little bit on the inside, but I usually wait till it's butterflied out because you can't sort of, you know, you can't really get in there. So grab a decent boning knife. It's probably, if you've got like, this is my fancier one, but we are going to hit a lot of bones here and sort of cartilage and that. So I usually use a dodgier one, still sharp, but a dodgier one that you're not worried about sort of twisting through all the bones and that. And I roll this to the side. So what we're going to do is, I don't know if everyone can see because it's obviously a bit awkward spinning things around, but where you've got the main spine, can we see down the middle sort of or not? Where you've got the main spine here, either side of the spine between the ribs is sort of soft bones and cartilage. So we're just going to run the blade either side of the spine. Just keep going up and down. You don't want to go too deep because you don't want to pierce the skin. The worst thing you do is obviously pierce the skin because we're going to cook this meat side down first then flip it over to skin side and it will stay skin side for the rest of the cook. Obviously, if we've got holes, all the liquid, everything you're rendering out, all that juice, all that stuff you're trying to keep in there is just going to drip out. One, you're wasting all that liquid and two, especially for my style pit, because the fire is from underneath, it could end up in a fat fire. So you're trying to, try to keep the skin without any damage to it. So I don't know how much we're going to be able to exactly see of this. I don't know where that camera is looking. I'm assuming it's looking at my ugly head, but we are going to run this blade alongside the spine and just in between the ribs and the spine, you can quick, easily nick your knife through them. And we're just going to separate the ribs from it. I don't know if you can see much there because I'm actually probably going to have to do it upright because I can't even get in there yet. <laughs> so, it's as I said, we'll bring some close-ups and all that once I get into it this a little bit, but you just sort of bring the knife up and down, keep going back and forth. Every time you swipe it through, it goes a little bit deeper. And this one, like this morning's pig, they've left it connected through the neck here. So we're just gonna remove that bit. So, funnily, this is about the sixth little pig I've done. I've done the couple big ones as well. But through all the neck here, they've never had the bones. This time they have, which threw a bit of a spanner in the works this morning because I was like, what the hell have they left attached? So, get that out of the way. So all they've left... I'm not even going to try to, I'm not very good on my, uh, you know, who's, who knows a pig skeleton or bone works? Even a human, I know nothing. So this bone is, they've left the esophagus through the middle and the bones that have gone all around that part is what's holding the two sh uh, shoulders together. So as I said, that, that was the first time I've come across that way. I don't know if it was because I ordered two pigs this time that they were sort of being a bit quicker and just going, we'll just leave, leave him a bit more work to do. So I've just taken that part out, taken the sort of, esophagus out and then as you can see that's starting to now open up so I'll go a little bit further so you don't want to go too deep with the knife 
leave the belly and the skin intact. And you just keep working the knife up. And then a little bit more. All right, so that's getting pretty close, but as you can see now, that is starting to really open up. You can all see that where I sort of either side of the spine. So you're just trying to get it to sit sort of as flat as you can. I don't want to go crazily though, because as you've seen that being butterflied, because we are going to end up cooking this. Now this is for my scenario. Obviously you guys might all be different deciding how you want to do one day, whether, you know, obviously you can build a hog pit with cinder, cinder or what do you call them? Bessa bricks, not cinder, that's American, but you know, your bricks and your mesh and do all that. Generally, at some stage, I'll end up skin side down. So if you're splaying too much, you can sometimes worry about, as this softens and renders, that it actually peels over too much. And then same thing, all that liquid that you've sort of tried to keep and retain in here is just gonna spill out. So I butterfly it till about there, so just the shoulders are sitting down on themselves. We then can split through the hams a touch more. Now the hams are super lean. Break through that as well. And then the next sort of step is just cleaning anything up. Like sometimes they leave all bits of side inside the head and mouth and all that. You know, you can clean a little bit up in here. This one's a bit cleaner, other, apart from the esophagus part, a lot cleaner than the one I did this morning. Remove a little bit of uh, skin and silver skin through here. I said, I reckon every single pig you sort of seem to do, they're different every time. Remove a bit more of this, because that's all only about a mil, or, you know, a couple mil thick. It's not going to turn to nothing. Expose a bit more of the meat. And then, what we would also like to do, because pretty much all this is bare meat now, we we'll can season all this up. The hams though, so in terms of how you sort of look at a pig, we've got the shoulders and you've got the hams. I've got the ribs through here. The top sort of section up along the spine there is what you'd call the loin, the meat on top's all through the loin through here. And then the underside on that's all your belly. So you've got your belly, your loin, the ribs, your shoulders, if it was a lot bigger pig, we might be able to get a little bit off this today, but I don't know how many people of you tried pork jowls or pork cheeks, absolutely delicious. This being quite small, there's not gonna be much meat on it. It'll probably only be like a 50 cent coin. Even a real big pig, they're only sort of about a tennis ball size bit of meat, but they're delicious. And then down to the ham. So the hams are the leanest part on pretty much the whole pig. It's probably why they generally just do get turned into ham. It's a great cured, you know, a great sort of meat to use for that sort of stuff. Doing whole hog with them, I'm still finding that part is the trickiest part of the cook. I can nail pretty much majority of the whole pig, but the hams are a lot trickier. Uh, it's just because they're lean. So generally when we're cooking this, we're gonna get majority of it up to your 180, 190 Fahrenheit sort of, which can start drying out some of the sections, but we need to get that so the shoulders and all that will pull. So a lot of the time with whole hog, they call it chopped, which is they get it to the point that it's breaking down enough, but then you sort of just chop it up with some cleavers. So you've got some different textures, and that's a great thing about doing whole hog is that you get all the different textures, like through the belly, you're gonna get these nice strands of belly. You're gonna get through the sh uh, shoulders, you'll get it so pulled. All the rib meat in between the bones is really nice and gelatinous as well. But the hams, because they are leaner, it's a lot better not to push them too far because if you take them all the way to the same doneness as what you'd take this, they sort of become a little bit strandy. So it's sort of better to not push these as far and you just sort of chop them up a bit. So for saying that, because they are a lot leaner and they're coated with skin the whole way around when you butterfly them, we want to just remove a little bit of this skin just so we can get some more seasoning on there, a bit more flavour. So don't worry about being overly neat, but the biggest thing we're trying to do is expose the meat and don't go too 
far this way, only because same thing, which no on my luck, I probably will have. But if you take too much skin off that side, once that starts to break down and shrink, all that's going to render will just render straight out because it's not trapped. So we'll see, that is borderline. We'll remove a bit here. And I said, as, as the goal, the way doing this, because it is more of a low heat, generally the skin will get crispy, but it's not the same crackle. So like, you can get it nice and snappable, and generally you'd mix it through. So you make up, you, you know, you'll pull all your bones out. You, if it stays in it whole, you keep all the pulled meat actually on the skin itself. And then as you're gonna go serve, you just break bits up, you break it through, you know, whether it's in a roll or it's on a plate, you just put a little bit of the skin through it as well, just for some crunch factor. But it's a very different skin and mouth feel than what you'd normally get if you're hot roasting something like we do when, you know, doing a roast pork. So that's about it on the prep. The other thing you can do, which, the other one this morning was already done, I think. But we still, like if you've done pork ribs, you would have probably all removed the membrane on your pork ribs. So these obviously still have the ribs in it, so we remove the membrane. So we try to get in here. So generally the easiest thing is just a bit of paper towel. It's a lot harder when there's a lot of other angles and that. It's nice when you just grab the edge of it off the ribs, but we'll see how we go. So membrane. And also another thing, membrane on a lot smaller pigs is a lot softer than what you're used to when you're doing a big proper rack of ribs. It tears a lot easier. But I think we might have got that one now. So that's just the membrane, as you can see, peeling off. And all we're doing that for is the same thing. We can get the rub to sort of actually give it the flavor on the meat rather than the silver skin or the membrane, because this membrane is just gonna dry up to, you know, like your sort of wax proof paper. It's gonna be no, no good really. Most, you'll find most people always remove it. It just eat, makes a eat, better eating bit of meat. So I remove that one. And oh, I've already got a bit of paper towel. Grab this other one. And hopefully that one comes off as easy as that did. It's gonna, it's gonna be hard, is it? Come on, there we go. And then once they're done, we're going to inject it, season it, and then we'll check on the other one. All right, so that's coming off. Now, in terms of flavors, you guys, if you like what you've had today or you haven't, you know, tried it yet, try Mama Rub, and hopefully you love it. But otherwise, you know, season it however you like, you know. Everyone's got different taste buds, but I designed my pork rub with knowing that pork is generally quite sweet anyway, and this isn't just talking about whole pig, but we're just talking about where you're doing ribs, pulled pork, whatever. Pork in general is sweet. Most people are gonna add a sugary form of rub or a sugary sauce to it. So I made my rub just super savory, because I think pork's already sweet enough. I'd prefer a savory flavor to it, because if you wanna add sauce to it, that's where you can get your sweetness. Otherwise, I think just pork with a sweet rub and a sweet sauce, all of a sudden you're eating candy, to me, it's rich, it's fatty, and then you've got all this sweetness. It's just too much for me. So I've made my pork rub pretty much 100% savory. I think out of the four rubs, it's got the less sugar out of all of them, which is sort of weird, because usually your pork rub would have the most sugar. Well, mine's got the least sugar in it, because I'm all about just keeping it savory. So that is pretty much the basic sort of rundown. You can take a little bit more of fat off, but I'm gonna leave a bit of it here. I won't expose all this meat. I'll try to keep a bit of protection here. We've got the ribs bare now, the membranes removed. We've butterflied it out enough. Hams are split. We've taken a bit of skin off there, so we've got the exposure on the meat. We will do a little bit of injecting. So we're just using the Cosmos original pork one here. And I'm just gonna, it's obviously very tasty stuff because the bees just drowned itself in it. So we're just gonna do a bit of injecting in the hams, a bit in the shoals, a little bit between the ribs. All right. And 
and it will leak out, but we'll try to get a bit more moisture and flavor in there. So injecting, you don't have to use something fancy. It's just that obviously in the American stuff, and now we do have a few Australian people doing injections as well, but it's all about adding flavor. And a lot of the proper, proper injections have I don't know what the word is, is it phosphates or something? All that stuff that actually chemically has been designed to work with working with proteins and meat, that it actually clings onto moisture and makes hopefully a better end product. You could just inject it with apple juice and vinegar or anything like that. But a lot of the a lot of the pre-made ones, there's actually a reason for it. They're, you know, it's a it's a product they've designed specifically for that job. So it's gonna help with moisture retention and generally add some flavor as well. So we're just gonna pump this full. While I'm doing this, any questions on anything else, what we've covered yet? Or is that all sort of basic enough for now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, you can do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, this one's a good little one that I am sort of moving in and out. So you've got, you know, you've got a opening right at the end and another one 10 mil up and each click, like each click does a set amount every time. Some of the ones you can use also like you actually, they'll have holes all the way up. So you only have to inject once and squeeze because you've got holes everywhere. Other times you will, you see, especially when we're doing brisket, especially comp stuff, you're sort of injecting as you're sliding it. So you're trying to get it everywhere. Um, I'm just trying to get a few, yeah, a few different depths in, in the hams and then we'll come down between the bone, uh, ribs and pump up the ribs a little bit. It's a, it's a, um, an injection profile from, uh, Cosmos Q, wherever that's, sorry, yeah, Cosmos Q. So it's their pork injection. So not just Cosmos, but Cosmos have been around for years and they are a really good injection brand and they do rubs and sauces as well. But you'd probably find not that this here is competition barbecue as such, but all the people that have done comps would have used some form of injection to, whether it's for their own chicken, whether it's for their brisket, whether it's for their pork. Um, they might taste like the, 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 the initial flavor when you mix them. They, it's not like something you'd taste or drink because it is quite funky and punchy, but it really works well with me once it's cooked and done all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's a different thing as well. So like, uh, sometimes you can just do it half an hour before or an hour. Sometimes depending on how big your mixture is and ratios, you can do it overnight. It all depends on yeah, what you're trying to achieve and your mixture ratios as well. Because sometimes this stuff, you could actually chill it and you can sort of go a little bit lighter on the mixture ratio and it's almost like a gel and people will like to put it in when it's a lot thicker and colder because they reckon, you know, it stays in there a bit better rather than running out, but I don't know. Yeah, there's a few difference. I don't even know what this one exactly, what the time is. I don't think it actually really runs through it on this one. Nah. But yeah, everyone sort of comes up with their different sort of ratios. The only one I'd probably not be careful with, but with certain of them, if you're doing, um, injection or brining with chicken is you can overdo chicken. Like too long with chicken, it can make it just mushy. So the texture of it, even though it's cooked, when you go to eat it, it just goes quite mushy because whatever's in them br starts breaking the muscles down. And probably with injections, one thing, unless you're sort of doing comp, that's the only worry is when you've when people have done comp barbecues with injections, you can be careful because you can actually get injection marks. So when you slice your brisket, you can sort of see sometimes a, a stain almost from where you've injected. But if you're just cooking for every day, you normal, you know, it doesn't matter. Perfect. All right. I think I was going to get covered in so much stuff. <laughs> I'm out, out of touch with the old injection all the time. I used to do it every month, weekend. 
All right. So, barbecue-wise, depending on how you want to do it, if you've got running an offset or like a sort of cabinet style or box like this, if you want it to take all day, you're probably going to cook it sort of your 225 to 250 Fahrenheit or, you know, 110, 120 Celsius sort of thing. Um, I like to cook them a lot hotter, so I've sort of been trying to run that at 275 to 350 Fahrenheit or, you know, 130 to 160-ish Celsius just because I want to get it done a bit quicker. Also, you know, I just I just cook hot everything, not not just because of time-wise, I just like cooking hot. I don't, what, one is obviously the biggest thing is time. I don't want to stand around for 10 hours. Um, so I cook, like to cook a little bit hot. I think you, you still get great color, you know, good texture on everything. And the biggest thing is you do save time. I suppose early days of whether it be this or a brisket or whatever, I know, you know, Everyone does probably enjoy having a drink, but you know, drinking for 10, 12 hours and then half the time you go to eat whatever your food is and you barely taste what you're cooking. So I sort of cook a lot faster these days just because you know, family, got stuff to do, so I cook a lot hotter. Um, but the, doing a whole pig, it's gonna handle it. It's still indirect cooking. Like if you're running an offset that hot, you've still got your firebox here, your pig sitting here, so you're still gonna get flow. It's still indirect. Um, if you're, if you're cooking like, um, you know, like in the, a proper like brick pit, just with a bit of mesh and having the pig over some coals and you're sort of shoveling coals under the pig where you need fire. Now that is an awesome way to cook them. Obviously here it's a bit different because you'd have to build the whole thing and it would take you a long time because you, you burn your fuel down and then you shovel it under. They're similar because it's running no baffle plates. So all you're doing is it literally an indirect heat from the distance but you're still cooking at that sort of three, 325 Fahrenheit. Um, so basically this sort of size pig at the higher temperatures, is probably gonna take somewhere between five to seven hours, give or take. Um, yes? Yep. Oh, sorry, all right, so five to seven hours. Um, that question was, have I ever done one on a pallet smoker and what's my thought? So pallet smokers are brilliant. Like, um, haven't done a pig in one yet. Funnily enough, the pallet smoker I picked up last week is probably big enough to do one. So I might actually try that. Um, you'd probably just run it the same. You'd um, set it at your, you know, anywhere 250 Fahrenheit, 350 or fat Fahrenheit, one, you know, whatever that is, 110, 130 Celsius, um, and just run it till it's sort of done. I'd probably, you won't be able to probably butterfly it in a pallet unless it's a really wide pallet, but most of them you'll probably have to do it in the running style. So yeah, it could definitely work. I might actually have to try to get a little one and give it a crack. But in terms of are they a good pit? Yep, they're, t they're good for your you know, busy schedule and all that and maintenance free generally. You turn the thing on, you fill it up with pallets and away you go. All right. Uh, Butterfly out of all of them will be generally the quickest. Same as like, I love doing them and we do them always at the class just to show that. Just doing like your butterfly or spatchcock chickens because it just, you can knock out a chicken really quickly and get the doneness through obviously all parts really nicely. It's super juicy and it just saves the cooking time because instead of being this, you know, round sort of chicken, you flatten the thing out. Everything's the same thickness, same as this. Now, these are all the same thickness. Um, Apart from the hams are probably the biggest and they will be the slowest to cook. But it's just, it's the quickest method, yeah. All right, we'll just do the last bit through the sort of loin and belly. And then I'll give it a season and we'll check what that pit's doing. And there's no big, big bits of smoke coming out, so it hasn't caught on fire, so we're all right. I know this pit has had quite a few little pig fires in it over the years. I'm lucky I haven't come across one yet, so. It's just after doing one of these, they make a lot of mess. Like you can imagine a whole animal, whether it be obviously pig or whatever you're doing, dripping the whole time. There's a lot of fat and it all catches in things. And when you cook and direct sort of, it does have a baffle plate, but that fat still sits on a baffle plate and you've got two fire boxes raging underneath it. It's a really easy thing to actually get a fire. So if you're in an offset, 
if you're ever going to do one, you just want a clean, a clean sort of pit. Um, if you've been cooking it for months and you're running, all that pig fat's going to drip down as well. You just got to be careful of fires. All right, I think that's about it on the injection. So I'm just going to, one quick look at these temps again. And we're going all right. Take that one out a bit. Yep, that's good. All right, we'll shut that one actually. So, now we're just going to do some seasoning. Get a little bit of liquid out, just so it doesn't, the seasoning doesn't just turn to mush straight away. So everyone's across that with the breakdown. The breakdown's pretty easy. Like, once you've done a couple, and now that you can, you know, obviously see where you've, through those sort of soft bones at the end of the ribs, it's pretty sort of easy. Um, the trickiest part actually was today because I hadn't come across it before was move, moving these bones here, which I'm assuming are probably, she didn't say that, it's probably almost like your AC joint sort of around your neck here. Like having that attached made it just hard to get your knife in, but every other pig I've done, they've already removed that out. So it was already starting to fall apart there anyway. And then once you ran your knife through it, they just fall, they just open up. Do the hams a little bit, move your membrane, and then we're good to go. So, Wipe that up a bit and then get a new one of these on. Now the rub, as I said, I'm using my swine and dine. I designed it for purely for pork and to be hopefully, as I said, savory and different just because I wanted it savory. I didn't want a sweet rub at all. Um, I wanted it to work well with the meat and not sort of make it sweeter than what it already is. Um, we'll apply that, let it sit for a little bit and then get that pig into the pit. As I said, if you want to try something else, like, you know, doing just smoked pork with salt and pepper, even that is a brilliant start. Like belly, you know, shoulders, salt, pepper, it's a great basis for anything. But as I said, if you enjoy this today and you haven't tried it, um, go inside and give it a crack. We'll just season this up. Now you can also, a lot of people also do salt the skin, but, I've just found, like, not that, not that there's any, there's obviously benefits to doing it, but I just find you sort of get enough, the skin generally dries out enough anyway, and um, being that this is savoury for me personally, because this is already a savoury rub, I don't want to, once I start mixing skin through, I don't want to go too salty, because you're already savoury. But you can also salt the skin if you want to try to help with the drying process when you're actually cooking it. And as I said, don't think like, obviously doing a whole pig is a bit different, but if you've got a bit of property, a bit of space, you can build your own with the bricks and a bit of Rio and just lay the pig across it, put your coals underneath. I'd still love to do that properly one day. You see a lot of the guys do it at the festivals and you know, obviously it's big in America as well. It'd be awesome to give that a real proper crack. Offset, I used to cook these in the offset. I'd done a couple in my offset back in the day in the running style. They do take a little bit longer, but you can do that. And as I said, I reckon if you could get one in a pallet, I don't see why not. It'll just be the space. So that's going to give me a new little project. Next pig, I'm going to do it at home and try try the pallet out. All right, a little bit up in here. So as I said, the main thing. You want to try to keep this flat. You want to try to, as you're cooking, which we can go through a little bit after, but you try not to let it fold out. You don't want to pierce the skin because of piercing the skin, you're just going to lose all that liquid. Um, and it can also be dangerous with fat fires. So you've got to be a little bit gentle. Um, what we will do is once this did go in, or will go in, once this goes in, it will go in for probably about two to three hours before we flip it. All we're trying to do is get a lot of like a bit of color on the underside. Then we'll flip it. If you wait too long, having it skin side down, obviously, uh, sorry, meat side down first, you can get too much color on it because the heat's coming from below in that style pit. 
The other thing is if the skin starts to dry out too much and then you go to flip it, all that skin's gonna shatter and you're gonna break all that skin. So that now is gonna be pretty difficult to move, but I've got it skin side down, so hopefully I can just drag it out onto that board and then we're ready to serve it. But if you leave it skin, uh, meat side down for too long, as I said, and then you go to flip, that skin's gonna be so brittle and your hands will just go through it. And once you flip it, you're just gonna have all the fat and juices just leaking everywhere. So that can probably just sit for a minute like that. Um, in terms of doneness, as I said, you sort of, we know pulled meat, generally you can start pulling most of this section from about 190, 195 Fahrenheit or about 90 Celsius up to 95 is generally pretty good for the pulled. The hams we're gonna take off, well not take off, but the hams are going to hopefully be a little bit further behind because if we take them too far, they might be stringy. So fingers crossed I get it pretty good today, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm still learning with this section and I think a lot of pl places that's what everyone asks about, how good are the hams? Like, where have you got them to? Because they are really tricky. And I know when speaking to like, or watching their videos as well, we met him in America, Evan Leroy from Leroy and Lewis. When they do hogs, and they do them a lot, they actually remove the hams completely. So they take the hams off, they mince them for sausages, and they just cook half pigs without the hams. Because they, for them, they, they might as well use that for their sausage because it's lean and just do two halves because they know all the rest of the meat is gonna cook the same and be a good consistent quality. So that's where that is at the moment. Any questions on any of that or anything else about that with the cook? As I said, like the cook part's gonna be a bit different because whether you guys are gonna try, you're just interested in it or whatever, um, it's gonna be more what you can actually fit and you know, Time-wise, temps will be sort of similar, but obviously a pig like this will only fit in certain barbecues, I guess, as well. So I'm just gonna check the where this one's at. We are gonna do a heap of chicken wings on the Cypress as well, which I've got to prep, but if this first one's ready, yep. Nah, that's it really. Yeah, so it's just, I'll leave the skin like that. As I said, you can salt it, but generally this will go in Meat side down first for a couple hours, then carefully flipped. Then hopefully as the skins now become the base, it will trap all the liquids as well. Meat keeps breaking down. The skin just continues to dry out more and more to the point you can just snap it. And then if you want to serve the skin, those bits of skin just get chopped up and mixed through with the meat. But as you can salt it if you want. I generally don't. Just with the way I'm doing flipping there as well, most of the stuff in that process, you're going to lose it all. Like by the time I flip, it's just going to hit and fall off anyway. So I just leave the skin as it is. So that's right, I think. We'll go check this, where we're at. So this has got, went on at about, I got here at five o'clock-ish. It had obviously already been flipped, as you can, can see, it's skin side down. Um, it's starting to get pretty soft. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty damn close. So up around 180 through most of there, 190, 195. We're pretty close. That is pretty close. If anyone just, you, I'll get out of the way. Just any, like I'm sure some of you guys want to have a quick look and all that sort of stuff. So the hams are getting pretty good and typically it's going to start raining. But you can see at the moment, the skin's all sort of stayed intact. It's starting to break down a bit. The ribs are starting to relax from the meat. The hams are actually pretty good. It's only one little section that could go a little bit longer. So, uh, went on about six o'clock, it went on at six. So I don't even know, what's that, five and a bit, five and a half hours? Yeah, yeah, six hours. I've cooked pretty hot though. Like it has been that sort of 325, 350 Fahrenheit. Yeah, so yeah, nearly, nearly, well, nearly five and a bit, five and a bit. So it's getting pretty close. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll, not yet, nah. I've got, I do have a bit, a little bit of merch in there, but not much. <laughs> 
I got stickers. I got stickers for free. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't even know how many I bought. <laughs> All right, so that's not far off. I could probably pull it in a minute, but we'll just do a little bit of a tidy up. I might light that fuel there so we can get the chicken on and then get ready to sort of start breaking this down. Because I think, yeah, I think we're pretty good. Yeah, we're pretty close. I should have left them on. All right. All right, so that can just hum along for a minute. We're pretty close with that. Um, is that it, Wilkie? Nothing else? Pressure, all right, sweet. So, Manny, oh, g'day mate, it does smell pretty good. <laughs> Hopefully it tastes just as good. So, that's prepped. Um, I might wheel the flaming coals out the way, or the cypress, sorry, the cypress grill out the way. Light that sort of off somewhere. Um, and move that table, I reckon. We'll move the table sort of, because if it's starting to rain, even if we move it, I don't know where yet, just to sit the pig out for a minute, because that will stay piping hot for a while. So, all right, I'm just trying to think what we can do. Get that one off. All right, let's have a look. I'll have to get the other rack ready. What's your thoughts? Wilkie, where, 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 where? Uh, that a little bit of that. And then the sauce, I'm just giving it a little bit of liquid just because it's almost close, it's got enough color. I'm just running, this is at the Flaming Coals barbecue sauce, but we just go 50-50 with vinegar. You can mop, you've probably seen heaps of barbecue places mop. I just find, I don't know, I just find a squirt and it's a lot easier. You're not sort of messing it up as much. I know with a mop, you're sort of feeling it so you can feel the meat as it breaks down a bit. For, for me, I sort of just do the probe and touch a few things and then I'll just sort of, you know, put the squ squirt it on is a bit easier and cleaner. All right. So, typical rain now, typical. All right. Let that go for a minute. It's got a little bit still humming along. All right. All right, I'm thinking, make some space, get that off. Might just do the chicken, get that going. Let's leave this for a minute. So light the chicken, get that out of the way. Get them out of the way. Ah, uh, grab the chicken, yeah, I'll just light the fuel. Grab the chicken, sorry guys, I'll just light this. And um, we'll give that a little bit touch longer while I get that sort of sorted. Then we'll break it all down and hopefully it all tastes half decent and you enjoy it and you know, we'll get the wings done. They won't take too long either, probably about half an hour. Um, and then this one I'm gonna put on and as I said, generally it'll go till you're sort of happy with the underside of the color, which can be anywhere from two or three sort of hours, depending how hot you're cooking. Carefully flip it over so it's now skin side down and you just cook it until it starts breaking down. Obviously, as I said, time, barbecue, and I say this at all my classes, barbecue is one of those things where it's really hard to go by time because everything cooks a little bit differently. Temperatures change. You know, you can have two briskets at whatever size. One might take six hours. One might take nine hours. Like, it's really hard to gauge. You sort of got more going to go by a feel of, what things are happening when you're actually cooking. And that's obviously an experience thing. 
but it's also um, just something that you, you do pick up. You pick up and then once you understand why things are happening, you know whether you need to up the temperatures, you know, lower the temperatures, all that sort of stuff. So I've got the chicken. I'm going to, how am I going to do this? I need a bowl. We'll slide this along. Ah, uh, jeez, I think that's the... I'm trying to think what we grabbed out this morning, if it's the iron bark or the red gum. I think that's the uh, iron, iron bark, yeah, iron bark. Iron bark. So just iron bark and lump. Ah, uh, I think I'll just use a foil tray. I'll just grab that foil tray, yeah. Sweet, that's awesome. Yeah, awesome, I'll just grab a foil tray. Yeah, I think so. I don't know how many I'm going to actually use yet. So I'm sort of, yeah, running this on a bit more iron bark, just trying to keep it a bit hotter. Sometimes, depending on what I'm cooking, sometimes I'll just run it on briquettes or lump and just use a few, you know, cherry chunks of that. But a bit, bit colder, trying to keep a bit more of a flame. I've just been burning splits every sort of half hour or 45, putting one split in each side. All right, so that's that one done. Thank you. I can go there, get the chicken. So, so yeah. That's sort of it on, a little bit on the pig. A um, bit more when we get the other one out. I'll get some chicken sort of prepped and on some skewers. It's very typical of Melbourne though lately, this bloody weather. All right, I can sit there. They're all coming back up. Yep, all right, uh, skewers, sorry, skewers. Ah, uh, this is my chicken rub on these ones. So, clucked and plucked. Oh, uh, I've got a few, but we haven't actually got it in stores yet in the larger containers. Like, if you, if you, usually each batch I get, when I get the batch done, we need to um, know how many containers to do pre-batching it. So, I usually get, say, six tubs done, but in the end, now that I've been catering with it all, I end up using all the tubs myself. <laughs> but I have said that from now on, every batch we do of whichever rub it is, I said, let's just make a dozen or so tubs, because there are quite a few people asking about them. Nah, I get most of my stuff from Cali's, Turretin. Yeah. I used to, like, I'm in Furniture Gully, and I've got some butchers that are okay, but nothing that has really good quality or, you know, not really good quality, but just the choice, you know, if I want to have them pick between 10 briskets or whatever, yeah, so most of it's Cali's. Um, the odd occasion, Mornington, go down to Mornington, Prime Cuts, because they got really good beef down there. And then some of the other stuff's just from um, Costco. Uh, I would say between the two, so between if I was running iron bark and red gum, red gum was probably initially a lot more viable and easy to get, but I think I prefer iron bark. I think red gum can be easily too heavy on the smoke. Iron bark probably burns a little bit cleaner, but red gum, if you're not burning it correctly, it can be a bit too rich. So that's my thoughts on those two. Both give really good heat, 
but I think red gum can be red gum can be a little bit too strong in flavour. All right, so try to get these on the skewers. And typically, usually when I do this, I end up putting the skewer through my hand nearly. So we're going to try not to do that today. All right. That way. Yeah, entire wing. So you go through the flat and then through the drum. So it's between the bones on the flat and then through the edge on the drum. It was just going to be, this will be just visually a little bit cooler than just laying them in the pit. <laughs> And then yeah, they're probably or maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. Oh, if, you, if someone wants, yeah, whatever. Yep. There's someone, it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, that's all good. No, <laughs> I'll get that rub out of the way. Yeah, grab some gloves. Just watch the end, that's the only thing you gotta be careful with. I'll stand over this side. I need you to sign a waiver, can you stab yourself? If anyone stabs themselves, it'll be me. So yeah, good gloves there, just grab a pair of gloves. And then all I'm doing is that, yeah, between the two bones on the flat, yep. and sort of keeping your fingers either side of it. Yep. And then once you're through, peeling it back around, and just trying to find a bit of the fatty bit of the drum yep. but yeah it's just that wiggle bit oh you you if unless you go bang you're sort of generally okay Yep, that's perfect, that's alright. Hey, hey. Uh, what are we going to go? How long is that? About that far, alright. Yeah, there's, there's an act to it, but it gets like... It's just... You know it's going to go through, but you're worried because if you push too hard, you, you know... Yeah, which I've done that... I've done it a lot of, a lot of times. I reckon... What do we got? Three, how many more trays? Three. Uh, that was two trays. Oh. What's, um, has anyone actually here at all cooked a whole hog at all? Like anyone else or no? Nah? You got it, yep, yep. How, what'd you, how'd you cook it in or what on? Oh, big sweet and just use wood, yeah, yep, yep. 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 Yeah, okay, yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay, yep. Yeah, nice. That's what, like, I think, I think there is, like, because obviously that low and slow heat, it's a different type of barbecue. So that's all, like, I'll, I'll be not confidently been saying hopefully that comes up really good but it is hard it's hard to get every bit spot on well obviously if you're roasting one you're dealing with high heat and you're pushing everything hot and you're getting that well not texture but it's a roast one isn't it so it's roast meat it's, it is very different and that's the sort of big um difference in your low and slow and your roasting you know that's why i can't go past doing hot and fast like pork belly and crackle because it's just I love the fat rendering, the juicy meat, the crackle. Um, it's a bit different when you do a pulled shoulder or whatever. It's just, you know, different way of cooking, different outcomes. I'll get some more on. Done. Can just sit that.
Yeah, I haven't done a whole one on a pig, like a pig for ages, like on the spit. And then I've done the lamb on the asado, like over the open fire, which is really good. Alright. Yep. Ah, uh, sort of close up a bit. Sorry, Wilkie, you want me in the middle, don't you? I was just... <laughs> um, yes, a little bit of a gap. I'll probably move them a little bit once we see how many we can fit on the skewers, I think. Oh, that's lid's done anyway. That needs cleaning. Alright, mix these up. I'm assuming that charcoal's probably nearly right. I'll mix this up and then move that charcoal, ready to go. Get a couple of the feathers. It's too tight, that one. All right. All right, mix them up. All right, that's all right, I'll get them that. I'm just going to move this charcoal for a sec. Spread that out. Put a little bit more out. Oh yeah, awesome mate, cheers. No, this is just their um, lump charcoal. I don't know which one, which one is that actually? Is that the, because you got the two types, don't you? Yeah, it's the hardwood one. The hardwood one, yeah. yeah. All right, that's all good. Yeah, yeah, keep whacking some of them on. Yep, sweet. Yep. Oh, you don't have to. Like, there's, there's no, there is obviously lots of pros to it, but just home cooking as well doesn't, like, it's, it's not, a, you have to, but there is, you know, pros to doing it. Um, I used to probably inject everything back in the day. I've started, or wanted to try to do a bit more with the hogs now, just to add a bit more moisture. But um, most of the time at the home, I sort of just run them normal, standard. Whether that's probably a lazy thing as well though, like forgetting about doing it, I don't really worry. Comp, when we're doing it, I'd inject everything. Yep. Um, but yeah, like you, you will see some benefits from it, but also if you cook it really well, it's not also entirely needed, it's just, um, I just wanted to try to help with the hams a little bit, get a bit more moisture in them. Same as I suppose brining chicken, like we used to obviously brine everything with comp, like trying to get as much flavour and moisture as own. But then at home, like, or if I'm just doing a roast chook, if you cook it really well, you don't always need it. You just gotta make sure you don't overcook it. It's just those things give you a bigger window of getting them correct or better, I guess. All right, so nearly got, what have we got, one more tray, but I think that will be uh, all our skews, skewers full. So after this, we'll probably make some room. I'm not sure where, but we'll probably move that table for the pigs somewhere. And figure out where we can sort of take it off and let it sit for a little bit. Yeah, I reckon so, I reckon, yeah. We'll, oh, we'll probably go another one, one, yeah, maybe one or two. Um, any of you eaten whole hog anywhere? Like at any of the places, yeah? Here in Astra Melbourne or? You came to the hog vember we did. So you had it from a big proper pig, yeah. Adrian Richardson, Oh yeah, like, yeah, okay, yep, yep. Yep, yep suckling, yeah. He funnily came to one of my first ever burger pop-ups. Adrian did, yeah. A really good dude. I didn't realise how little he is though. I th the TV makes him look two foot taller. Really nice guy though. But yeah, I reckon he, he would have been only just on five foot tall, I reckon. A real little guy. Yes? Yep. Uh, this is probably going to sit... No, we're not sound bad. I just find with wood, so... When you've got, the question was, sorry, why are we using a heavier wood such as ironbark instead of apple wood? Like, generally I suppose when you look at branding or 
anything across the board. They sell you like things like apple wood or peach or something for fish and chicken and pork. Things like mesquite, hickory for beef, all that. I sort of personally, and don't, you know, no one take that the wrong way. It's more, I think if you're burning wood correctly, they all taste pretty sweet to me. The big difference is if you burn a stronger wood poorly, so it's not burning clean, that's where the difference is. Because if you burn something like red gum, hickory or mesquite badly, meaning it's a dirty burn, you're gonna notice it. The meat's gonna taste very acrid and bitter because that wood is so much stronger. But if you're burning pretty much all your wood quite clean, it generally should be sweet and mellow, but that's just my opinion on that. Hopefully that answers that sort of. As I said, like the, you know, you'll probably read or seen the the perfect smoke is the smoke you can't see. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh. All right, so we're going to leave that for a second. Can I clean up? I'm a big mess in a minute. Any other questions on anything? It can be random. Like, I don't, while we're just waiting for a minute here, I'll do, get some stuff ready. I don't care. It doesn't have to be about whole hog, any barbecue questions, anything at all. I try to generally answer whatever, generally most of the time, I have a, hopefully a good enough answer for, but happy to ask and answer any of them. Yep. Yep. Uh, you could definitely, the only thing I suppose with dry rubs, because of the way they've been designed, I said mine's a bit different because there's not much sugar in it, but being dry rubs, it needs to obviously be on the bare side, like the raw meat, so that it will adhere to it somewhat. Um, you just have to find some dry rubs can have quite a bit of sugar in them. So being that it's actually over an open fire as such, or like a, a, a lot of fuel, yes, you've got indirect, but it's not as indirect as you would when you're doing low and slow sort of cooking. So you may just find that things can color a little bit quicker than what you're expecting. So yeah, all for it, you could do it. You just have to be careful with flare-ups and stuff because it's still going to be a long cook time. And if you've got that dripping down on coals and the flames are licking it quite a bit, whether it colours it quicker. So, I mean, I use my rubs personally at home. Like, these will go on the wings. We do it on roast chicken. I'll do it on a spun bit of belly or something. But you just got to be careful with your fire control because if it gets too hot and the flames sort of start licking it, it'll start to discolour pretty quickly. That's all. All right, so that's that. That's that. Uh, okay, so suckling pigs, they said a smaller one, 15 to 18. Um, yes, I have, like the 15 to 18 are a good size as well. I think even, I might get this, I don't know, someone else might have no knowledge on this. I think a true sort of suckling is even smaller than that. Like it's tiny. A true suckling is a lot smaller. Um, we call it here a suckling, but I think they're even smaller than that. They're almost like a dinner plate size, really, you know. You see them at the restaurants and that. So I have used them. Um, this is not much meat on them. Like even this, like there's not a whole heap of meat. This size here will feed about 30 to 40 people as a proper feed. Um, 15 or 18, you're probably going to feed about 20 from, 25 maybe. Um, but yeah, you can use them no worries. It's just obviously everything's thinner. There's not as much belly meat. There's not as much fat coverage. Um, and then your next sort of step up is you go to the big monsters, which you know are going to feed a hell of a lot of people. But yeah, you can definitely use that size, no worries still. Hey, yeah, well, yeah, okay, there you go. So, yes, barbecue spits were just saying then, like, that size is what they recommend for a, if you're doing it on a spit, that sort of size is a great size for it. Is the sweetest? The sweetest seasoning of mine would possibly be the chicken or even the lamb, I think. Yeah, they all th those two have a bit more sugar than the other two. The beef's got nearly no sugar, the pork's got no sugar, the chicken. Everyone generally loves. It's very savoury and got you know some nice flavours to it. And the lamb has a little bit of sweetness as well. 
So you can try some later, the samples, if you'd like. All right, so, I'll just double check this. That's all coming along. All right. We might just get these starting to spin and see what height we need to be. And then we'll check the pork. Yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, um... These, these 25-ish from that joint in... Oh, there is some kids here. But it was a, it was a butcher that used to be PHUC, that. So, if you can probably, yeah. They had a, every, I don't know, they've changed their name. So now it's called Springvale Quality. <laughs> How are we gonna go? Well, you might be right. Sweet. So, yes, in saying that, this size has been, I've found, they take a little bit longer, but they've been a good size. The prior ones I did that were a little bit thinner. And just for the low and slow stuff, they still worked really well, but um, they were quite lean in the belly section. So these, these have been an okay size. But in saying that, depending where you're getting it from, you reckon? Let's see. Oops, sorry. What have I done? There we go. Oh, come on. Tough one. Just that one there. Let's just. Just get that. It's going to stay up, isn't it? Oh. No, we'll get rid of it. You're going to get rid of that wing just so it spins <laughs> better. Oh, my knives are gone. Oh, they're not. There they are. Where are we running? This one here. That's good, are we? I think, yep. This one, which one? No, they're good. I just want to get rid of the feathers. I hate feathers. Yeah. All right. And then, sorry, um, going back to the pigs, price-wise though, if you want to have a crack at a big, like the difference between a full, full, like a 60 kilo, compared to one of these, is like 100 bucks. So you can get a full, 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 full one for like only 100, 150 more, generally. They're like mid 300s, but then you can get a, you can get one that's 30 kilos more for like 100 and some bucks more. So they're more, obviously because they're killing them earlier. Yeah, they're killing them earlier. They're upping the price. While obviously getting a bigger one, they can, you know, it's already grown to the size. They sell it for a lot less per kilo. But it's not going to obviously work. When we did the, as I said, the charity day, that was a 60 kilo pig. And I thought, no worries, but when it was at 2, the, 2, 2 in the morning, and I'd butterflied the thing, and I'd seasoned it, and then I was like, oh crap, I've got to lift this up into the pit by myself now. And then when it was hot, it was the same thing. I'm like, how am I going to flip? And Scott showed up just in time, and we were able to flip it. Because it was only 60 kilos, but when you butterflied it, and it's all just like a... You know, soft banana. I was like, how am I, I going to put this thing up? All right, so I'm just going to check the other one now. And then if it's sort of getting close, we might move. I don't know where we'll put this table yet, but we'll probably possibly move it here, maybe. Maybe. Is that all right, Wilkie, you reckon? In here somewhere or not? Yep. Get rid of these gloves. Give my hands a quick scrub. All right.
Oh, uh, anywhere from like minimum obviously 165 to 180, 190 Fahrenheit. There's some bits are like super soft. That's that's like in all honesty, it is hard. Like I'm still learning a lot of this each time, like little bits because you can get some bits really good, but because it is low and slow heat, like certain sections cook a lot faster and you know, um, the hams I think I'm sort of pretty happy where they're at. Through the belly seems really nice. The loins aren't too far because the loins are still up around the 180 part so they haven't gone too far. The shoulders might be a tiny bit tight but I don't want to go too far there because then you start to dry down the other sections. Because it's a bit different, like with roasting, you, you're probably what generally slicing it off or sh cutting it up a bit more than pulling it all, or is a bit of a mixture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. More, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, so there, that's all right. That's going along. Yeah, I mean, this is getting pretty close through every section, really. I found it a lot, to be honest, I found it a lot easier when they're bigger as well, because obviously you're dealing with a lot more of a muscle to actually break down. And so that's more just because being low and slow, it's just gonna, it is taking a long time, but, you know, your shoulders are this big when you're on a full grown, they're out, you know, you've got a lot more meat and muscle you're working with. I think that will all come apart pretty good. All right. So, what time have we got? 11.50? Oh, 15. All right. Um, try to think if I can try to get that other one in for a minute and we'll start sort of breaking a bit of it down. Get a bit more fuel going just for the next one. So, I'm only going to get a bit more fuel going to get this other pig on because that is going to... That's the rest of my day here, standing around here. Oh, break. Which is it? That one. Come on, go back up. I'm in the wrong spot, aren't I? Somewhere there. All right, good shot. Now I just have to keep an eye on them. Oh, there's that one, that one there. That one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just dropped them a little bit to get a bit more heat on them. All right. Get a bit more fuel. So obviously this pit of mine, it's just got two charcoal baskets. So through that whole sort of talk, then it's just dropped a little. We'll get a bit more fuel going in it. that going all right so that's all right we'll grab that table yep. I think yep. Yep. Just move, yeah yep. yeah we'll just come back here somewhere just back into here yep something like that that's right okay. yeah I'll do it for now yep, yep. sweet 
And let's see. Alright, that'll be pretty good I reckon, I don't think I'll go too much further on it. Alright, gloves, 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 gloves. Heat proofs. Now this is the awkward part, I'm trying to get that off without losing all the liquid and stuff. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so meat side down for the first couple of hours. And I said you want to flip it, if you're doing it that way, you want to flip it prior to it. One, getting too much colour on it, but also two, before the skin gets too stiff. Because when you flip it, obviously the skin will just crack. Can you rub on the skin? You could, I didn't know, I didn't worry. You could do salt, or I've just left it plain. Yeah. As I said, the way this, the skin forms, it's not really crackle. Some of it will snap and it'll be tasty, but because it doesn't puff up like our normal sort of crackle or, you know, like roast pork belly crackle or anything, um, some people mix it through. Other times they literally just use the skin as a serving thing. You literally just break it all onto the skin and then you eat the meat and that's it. You're just left with the skin sort of. So, right. oh, I'm not sure yet. I just got to figure out which one I'm going to do this. When it was a bigger pig, I remembered I, sh I should have put the tray in reverse so then I don't have these handles in the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you might need, you want to grab that, just get that under the head, under the belly a bit, just carefully, because the skin will be quite soft. We're just trying to push the whole thing, yep. Lose them a little bit. Ugh. What's caught cool. the belly? Oh. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yep, I've got it. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot about that metal board, didn't I? That's alright. Let's get that metal board up. That's going to stay there, isn't it? Yep. I forgot about the metal board. We're going to do it in the metal board just to make clean up a bit better. Woo. I might just slide it into a different fit. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it tastes good. All right. Yeah, we'll go this side. That's all right. All good. Yeah. Sweet. All right, that can just, yeah. <laughs> now I need to get one of these. Oh, get, get it, def get it, get the pictures. I'm gonna get this other pig on. Thank you, mate. All the times I've done it by myself. Glad wrap's gone. Yep. <laughs> oh. Whew. All right. They're off. All right, we'll just let that sit for a minute. 
the bees are going to try to have a little bit. Well, I don't wasp, are they? No, they're not. Wasp, yeah, wasp, yeah. Well, the wasp drowned itself then, not the bee. All right. That will all be quite hot. So I'll let it sit for a minute. How these looking still all right? Yep. Now nah, I think I'll probably have to move the top ones. Yeah, I'll probably have to move the top ones. A little bit more fuel there. See how they're going. They're starting to get some nice colour. Yeah, I think this one will have to move to, you know. All right, so, get my other gloves again. I'll let that sit for a minute. So, hopefully, hopefully, as I said, I'm not promising anything, because I'm, I'm learning as much as a lot of other people, but we've been doing these a bit now for the for like catering and some events. And I'm getting a lot of it. The hams are still tricky, doing them well and slow. I can see why people do decide to chop the hams off. But you can always get a mixture of between pulled and chopped. So texturally, whole hogs, obviously, you know, you get a lot of different textures from the different cuts of meat, um, different fat contents, flavors even, because some of the bits of pork are a little bit sweeter than other bits. Um, I've really enjoyed doing them, but I will admit, I'm always still learning. Every cook, I'm learning. So hopefully the flavor is really good, the moisture is really good. Colour, I'm pretty happy with the colour. The skin's gone pretty crackly through there anyway. So I'll let that sit for a minute. I'll just get this other pit humming along a bit more. Then what are we going to do about the serving part, Michael? What do you want to do? Just those forks and a bit of paper towel, or we got napkins somewhere? Yep, napkins, yep, sweet. Yep, awesome. I will take, I'll use one of these, just get all the bones out. Like, one of them definitely yeah, all the boat, sorry, yep. Towel, awesome. Get that going a bit. No, I've got, I've got, I was just about to get it. <laughs> I take this to every little catering event we do. So yeah, I do use this a lot. It was one of the best little purchases just for when we're doing things, just to get a bit more fire going. Just, just. I've only melted it a couple of times. But at least, at least with a the Zito they work and then you, you know, they, they're so cheap you just buy another one, you know, they're all like only about 30 bucks. Yeah, I've just changed the shape of it a bit. Alright, let that get going. The wings are all getting some nice colour. I will in a minute, I will. I'll give it a little touch more because they won't get much colour on the top, it'll just get a bit of heat, so I'll let these get a little bit more colour. Uh, I reckon probably it'll be about half an hour, maybe half an hour or so. I was going to say, all the guys here probably do a lot more spit cooking than I do. What do you reckon, Tony? Half an hour, maybe ish, 40? I'm guessing. Yes? Yep. Yep. Yes. Oh yeah, that was just purely because 
One being just splits, it's easier. Like the splits generally we're more inclined in Australia to get splits of iron bark or red gum. Um, if you wanted to get splits of anything like oak or cherry or anything, it's gonna cost a hell of a lot more. But yeah, personally, I just think most of that, like, I'm not saying it was a way of marketing, but is in, yes, the subtle woods work well with the meats that you don't want to be overpowered, like your fish, your chicken, your pork. And your stronger cuts like lamb and beef can handle a lot stronger woods. But I just think it more sort of comes down to burning the wood correctly. Like, I've got some big bits of wood in here. Yes, there's some smoke coming out the front because they're sort of just, you know, smouldering a touch. But when this was burning that whole entire time, you barely saw any smoke. So yes, it's burning wood, but it's burning cleanly. So my biggest thing is that that's why they sort of recommend it. Because if you burned red gum on fish and it wasn't burning clean, it's going to taste terrible because it's burning dirty. But if you were burning apple wood poorly, where it wasn't burning clean, you won't notice it as much because yes, apple wood is a little bit more subtle. So I think that's my, my, that's what I sort of my take on it is, is that those lighter woods, I won't say are more suited, it's just that, it's just, if you're not burning them correctly, they're not going to impact the outcome as much. Because you'd find most, like, you know, especially in America and that, whether it's Texas, it's all post oak. Everything's post oak, you know, and then you've got other states and countries where everything's hickory. You know, here, most of our barbecue restaurants, if they're burning splits of wood, it's either iron bark or red gum, and that's in, that's across the board. They're not like, oh, I'm putting chicken on now, I better take out that wood. They just burn cleanly, and that's it. So yeah, the biggest impact is burning dirty. I said before, the, the clean smoke, this isn't a perfect out thing at the moment because I've got the doors open and that, but the perfect smoke is a smoke that you can't see. You know you've got wood in there, but the smoke coming out is almost crystal clear. That's what you want. I remember the first cook I ever did on my offset many years ago. I can still taste it. I thought it was good, but we're trying to run at 225 Fahrenheit because like I, that's why I talk Fahrenheit so much. My pit from 10 plus years ago, Fahrenheit gauges before Facebook and all that. So it was all via internet forums where you'd type a question and wait for five days until someone would respond. It was all American. Um, and when I took ran my pit at 225 Fahrenheit. Oh crap, it went to 210. Throw another log on. Like I didn't understand fire control, so I'm just throwing wood on, wood on. The smoke's billowing out wide and black. It's good, all right? And then it disappeared for a bit. Oh no, there's no smoke. So I'd throw another log on. Unbeknownst to me, all I'm doing is just dirty smoke, you know? And the stuff tastes like an ashtray. We all thought it was awesome back then, but you sort of realized that the best smoke is the stuff you can't actually taste. Like it's just sweet and subtle. And I suppose that's why when you've not just become, I haven't done judging, but when you've done judging or you've done comps or you've done whatever, you do find a lot of people who, on the, that side of judging or have tasted your food will be like, oh, it didn't taste very smoky. And I'm just thinking that's probably because a lot of the time they're used to either food that has a bit of smoke or they're eating at a restaurant where they've used something like liquid smoke to make it taste smoky because good barbecue generally doesn't taste that much like smoke. You've got good bark, you've got your pepper, you've got all that, but the smoke is very subtle. So, yeah, that's my whole sort of take on it. All right, so I'm just gonna grab the little chopper if I need it. That's been wiped, I think, yeah. Sweet. Man, we're just gonna try to break a bit of this down. Uh -huh. oh, so good. Leave that bit there and then... Yeah. <laughs> Might get... I've got one more tray. Sorry guys. One more tray just for some of the skin. Just so I don't get it all like wet. And those chicken wings are still good and looking good. Alright, so we're just going to break down as much as I can. As I said, we'll see how much have I got, sort of hopefully half decent. You know, the shoulders and hams are a little bit tighter, but we can chop some of that. 
I'm the first to admit, I'm not the expert always. I'm still learning a lot of this stuff, but you know, I like to share and give. That's my main sort of goal. I mean, the belly's looking really good. The rib meat's looking really good like that. You know, real nice and fatty still. Yeah, some of the belly. So the belly should be long strands. Yeah, like real big long strands are just soft. Yeah, so really soft, juicy belly. Now I'm doing all the belly meat, I'm just gonna start getting bones everywhere. I'm like, where have I put them all? So they have bits of the loin, and that along the spine. There's some soft bones and that. So the soft bones are sort of, I suppose, edible, but they're not something you want to chew on, but they're things you can just get rid of. They're more like a gelatinous style cartilage bone. Yeah, they're along the rib cage, really, all off the rib cage, yeah. I was gonna say at the butcher yesterday, they've got them, I can't remember. In, they had them, they were um, soft bones. They sell plates of the soft bone section, but I don't know what type of dish it's for. So they do like break down quite easy. You can sort of just chew through them. Nah, that's all like, same as like when you get spare ribs. Like you can eat them at the end. They don't have any flavor. It's just that texture that you're like, uh. Oh, someone actually mentioned that last time. I was like, oh, I don't know, you probably should, shouldn't you? But yeah, I um, I will say after having Sully, now that we've got two kids, one didn't change us. Like I was like, yeah, hey, one kid, it's easy. But two's made me a little bit not as much time as I thought I'd have. Hence why, like you know, you probably seen like I, I still cook a bit, but nothing like I probably used to just because there's more more going on. I know, I know, I've had the like I've had the pizza oven set up with the bench thing now and I was like, I don't know when, I've just, I've cooked it once or twice on it but nothing that was like, oh this is awesome, I'll do a post about this, it's just been a steak here and there. I'll get there, I'll get there. Uh, no, so the class, so quick rundown of the class. I told you, you, we're here when I told you what barbecues. So we cook on a smoke, like, sorry, smoke, we cook on a pallet. So, yeah, all that. So we cook on all that. Our dishes, we start off with um, hot and fast chicken wings, like real crispy skin chicken wings. We then do um, make your own grind and make your own burgers, like from scratch. Um, jalapeno poppers, smoked queso, the Mexican cheese dip. Then we do pulled beef. Uh, sorry, pulled beef cheeks, pulled lamb, pulled pork, whole chickens, pork ribs, pork belly and crackle, pit beans. Uh, oh no, there's 11 dishes. So 11 different dishes all done live. Yeah. And we just cross the six different barbecues. I don't do a pig or anything, but, and I don't time wise, I like to do it live. And I, I could do a brisket, but I'd have to be doing it in a drum and pumping it out in four hours. And really, that's only going to. Only a few people are gonna, from the class, benefit from that. So no, the only times we've sort of done some of this is um, like a demo like this, or the charity day. So like for Hogvember, as I said, a few of you guys came along to that. We had 120 people show up for that and raised nearly seven grand. We just put all the meat, like put a whole 60 kilo pig and briskets on for free. Had a brewery part of it and that and just so I'm sort of doing that mainly for the events. Now that was um oh where was it today? Yeah I know. I should have thought about that. Anyway. We're doing the next one with the breweries. Is that you saying that? The next one in the brewery we're doing is in June. 
at um, Fixation, Fixation Brewery in Collingwood. So we've done one pop-up there, like a sold out pop-up for 80 people. So we've got another one coming up in June for them. All right, we're getting there, we're getting there. It's a slow breakdown. It's a bit softer, that one. Ah, uh, I've got a couple of Louisiana pellets. Pellet smokers, the question was. I used to have a Traeger. I run a GMG at the classes, and I just purchased last week a smoke fire, a Weber smoke fire, which I've only done the burn in on, but I'm really tempted to, or really keen to give it a crack. Picking, yeah, because they're a bit bigger. They're a bit bigger than all of them, yeah. I mean, especially running style, I don't see why you wouldn't fit one in it. And, I mean, yeah, it's a bit taller. They're a bit deeper. I've only done the burn in them, though. That's all I've done on mine, so I haven't had a chance to really do nothing. <laughs> so favorite my favourite what? Barbecue? Yeah. Ceramics. Generally, my favourite is the ceramic. Like obviously, you've said, I've got three of them, the three from Phoenix, and I just can't knock them. Oh, no, I still cook every night. I just don't do as much. I just, as much as this is going to sound wrong, but as much as I love barbecue, I love teaching, I love cooking, I prefer eating other stuff. Like, I, I like the process, I like the trimming, I like the seasoning, I like talking about it, I like sharing what I've learnt, but after eating so much of it for so long, I much prefer Asian flavours or, you know, Mexican flavours or, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, oh, I thought that was something catchy, it was the bottle. <laughs> yeah, I don't know which way we're going yet. I've got my, I've, I think I might do a spicy one. Just a spicy all purpose sort of one. Because people are always asking for hot stuff. I know it's a smaller amount of people, but I feel like that could work. All right, so there's some crackly bits, some non-crackly. Where's that bit I need to chop up? I oh, just, yeah, because it gets bashed. They'd, like I'd sh sharpen them, but, but same as I use there, the Matador brisket slicer, just because it's a $15 knife, but it actually, like it doesn't matter if I, I'm chopping on metal. Like it doesn't really matter. Like my, you know, my big expensive, three, yeah, the $300 sort of $400 brisket knives, I'm not going to, bash around on a board too much. Yeah, I use them at home, but that, for catering and that. Alright, we're getting there, we're getting there. Might swap that middle one to the top in a minute. This is actually a lot easier than my classes because usually I'm trying to multitask 11 dishes and six barbecues. I'm only trying to do two here. Yeah, they're not like, they're not overly Strandy a little bit, but they're still like, yeah, I don't know. All right, yeah, good, still juicy, still. Mm. 
All right, what do we got? A bit of meat there. Bone, ribs here. All right, the only thing, we do need napkins if someone's around. Where's Tony or? I think we just need a paper towel, is that what we got? Yep, all right. Because we're not far off a couple of minutes now. Yeah, all the all the meat up around the head's really good. Yeah. There's a lot of fat, but there's a lot of melt in your mouth meat. There's a cheek. So look, you can see how small the cheek is. Where's the other cheek there? Cheek. Shoulders pulling pretty good. That's nice to see. That's a shoulder meat. Chop that bit. So it needs chopping that pulls, that pulls. Oh, it's so hot, so hot. And then, What else got crackle there? Ah, oh, some of it may. That's the. Uh, I don't mind that, but um, not probably because it's so wet now. But it's just completely different because you've rendered a lot of the fat. Like it's different from our crackle. So you've rendered most of the fat out of it, sort of. That's why the skin sometimes works really well. Sometimes you get a little bit, sometimes you get a lot. All right. I just need a little bit of the, my rub. Change those chicken in a minute. Ah, uh, probably nah. Probably ten <laughs> ten plus years ago, and then I didn't do it for a little bit, and then I've sort of got back into doing pigs again. Yeah. I did a lot of other sort of barbecue for quite a while, and then when I got this trailer, I started doing a bit more pigs. Ah, oh, I don't know, it depends. Usually I just break it all up. Um, I mean, usually because when I'm doing it, it's just for catering. So it's just getting it ready for all the people and, you know. I'll leave that there anyway. All right. So I want to get some of this out. And cut some more out there. All right. Where was the paper towel we're using, Wilkie? Oh, is it there? Okay, yeah, right here. I just, yeah, couldn't see from here. Yeah, a bit of my rub, and then just mix that through, and we're laughing. Oh, my back. Sweet, perfect. Yeah, we'll 
Alright, who wants to, I suppose we can start digging in. That's the big bit. I don't need all that. Alright. Well, I don't know if people want to grab some towel, because that's all I said we got. A bit of paper towel, I'll get some tongs or plates, however you want to do it. And I can put some on everyone's plate. Well, oh, that was good that bit, really good. <laughs>
Thanks everyone who checked it. Uh, yeah. Thanks for everyone who watched that. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you got a bit of info from it. Um, sorry you can't taste it. Come along to the next one or, you know, you can always travel. It's not that far. Thanks guys. <laughs>